three, here's the African Art Museum, let's go in. Upon entering the National Museum of African Art, I was greeted by this powerful and very naturalistic funerary sculpture. It comes from Madagascar, and was likely made either by an artist from the Sakalava ethnic group, or the Bara people. This grave marker has been individualized, and depicts a warrior holding a spear dressed in a loincloth. The sculpture we see here is very unique. Other similar grave posts of Madagascar are more stylized and typically mostly nude. Textiles were a vital part of Malagasy cultures, and nudity was considered unacceptable, mostly. But despite this fact, the grave markers were depicted naked as idealized symbols of human sexuality, and just as sex is needed to conceive children, the unclothed, sexually charged images would let the spirits of the dead be reborn as ancestors. In the next room, there was a robot teaching kids about Africa. I forgot to film it. The robot you're seeing on screen was a duplicate one in the basement. I didn't spend much time with it, because I don't need a kawaii robot teaching me stuff about Africa I already know. Now let's move on. And now, we arrive at the first major room in the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. I f***ing love this place. Now, I'm sure that shiny egg at the center of the room caught most people's attention, but first, let us begin by looking at an artwork from Gabon. This figure is called Mbulu Ngulu. The Smithsonian attributes this particular work to an artist of the Kota people. But, is it really? I was recently able to contact an expert researcher of the Kota people, and according to him, the Kota never made these reliquary figures. But their inland neighbors did. These neighbors include the Shamaye, the Songo, the Obamba, the Wumbu, and the Nadasa. And from my own research, I can add to the list of neighbors the Hongui, the Mindumu, and the Sheiki. One of the things that unites these various peoples is their reverence for the relics of their ancestors. The reliquary figure you see before you is a guardian and was attached to a special basket containing ancestral bones. This particular Mbulu Ngulu has two faces, which is rare for these figures. One theory as to the reason for these two faces is that it may increase the ritual potency of the Guardian. After all, having eyes on the back of your head would definitely help when you're on guard duty. One more thing I'd like to mention before we move on is I actually created a character based on these figures, and one of these days I would definitely like to show her to you, but uh, that won't be for a while, but when we do get around to that, that will allow us to talk more in depth about this subject. Gaze into the eyes of this mysterious Bama mask. Its eyes are made of spider silk. Because the ground spider lives under the earth, it is viewed as a link between worlds, connecting the ancestral realm to our world. Therefore, the spider has divine knowledge. But that's not the only animal represented here. At the chin of the crest mask are the horns of an animal, likely a buffalo, and this would embody power. And at the top of the crest mask, there is a pattern carved into his prestige cap. This pattern represents the frog, which is a symbol of fertility. Next on display is the famous art of the Benin. These impressive brass sculptures are both an artistic marvel and technological triumph. In 1897, the British went into Nigeria and attacked the Benin Kingdom and stole these priceless cultural artifacts. Later, they sold a number of these artworks to other Western museums like this one. At some point, I would like to do an in-depth video about this event in history, but for now, let's focus on the art in front of us. In its correct cultural context, this sculpture would have been displayed on an altar honoring a particular oba. 
and Oba is a king of the Benin. Oba Ogala is said to have first introduced these brass heads in the 14th century, though the earliest surviving of these works date to the 15th and 16th centuries. This particular brass head, however, dates to the 18th century. The Benin brass heads of this later period can be distinguished from the earlier heads by a number of features, one notable example being the much larger coral bead necklace. Coral was important because it was believed that it made the Oba's words come to fruition. What you see here is a Benin mask. It is worn in the Odudua masking ceremony, which grants the Oba protection, as well as commemorates the founding of the kingdom. The mask may embody an Osa priest, and also Uen, one of the state gods who is concerned with the rains, the sun, air, and the fertility of land. Uen, as a health specialist, traveled with Oran Mion, a Yoruba warrior prince, who left Ife to found Benin's second dynasty. The large cylindrical headdress resembles both the palace turret and the crown Oran Mion is said to have brought with him from Ife to Benin. That enough lore for ya? I actually wanted to talk more about this mask, but I think we should save that for another day, because we got more artworks to talk about. So, let's roll on to the next one. Whoa, that's shiny! What is this, some kind of modern art? Dang, we rolled so fast we went into the future! Yup, the museum is home to modern art as well. This one comes from an Egyptian-born artist named Gada Ameh. The Smithsonian is featuring this as a central piece of this room as a way of addressing the underrepresentation of female artists. Gada is an internationally renowned artist for her technical skill, aesthetics, and her feminist views. This sculpture, called the Blue Bra Girls, was made as a tribute to the women of the world who protest, march, and stand up for what they believe is right. The name of the art was derived from an event that happened during the Arab Spring of 2011 in Egypt's Tahrir Square. At this particular protest, a veiled woman was dragged, stripped, and beaten by the military police. When she was stripped, her blue bra was exposed, and this image of her half-naked body about to be stomped upon became symbolic of the abuse of power by the Egyptian military. And so it became a catalyst for many women in the country to demand the end of military rule. Alrighty, now that we've looked at this beautiful modern art, let's take a step back in time to Africa's ancient past. We're headed to Mali at about the 13th to 15th century. Terracotta sculptures like this one are among some of the oldest known surviving artworks in sub-Saharan Africa. Little is known about these objects, though according to the late archaeologist Peter Garlake, the ancient terracotta art of West Africa was all very likely made by women. Yep, that modern art isn't the only thing on display that was made by a lady. Women aren't just creating the art of Africa's future, they sculpted its past as well. Now to be fair, other sources say we don't know for sure if these sculptures were made by men or women. But, Peter Gerlake's reasoning is, in my opinion, convincing, in that historically, women have dominated the art of pottery in Africa. And... There is no evidence to suggest that this has ever changed. So I agree with this archaeologist in that it is logical to conclude that the ancient ceramic artworks were indeed the creations of African women. Now I mentioned before that little is known about these objects, and there is a reason for that. And that reason is looting. When people loot these sculptures from their archaeological sites, they dig them up carelessly and we lose part of their cultural context. And when that happens, we lose the ability to learn more about black history. Now what should happen is a professional archaeological dig should take place so we can learn about the art and the people who made the art within historical context. Keep in mind, we aren't just talking about stuff that was stolen back in colonial times. We're talking about art theft happening in our modern era. I didn't intend to end this video on a sad note, but this is an important part of black history. If it's any consolation, I have read about some efforts to combat looting that have taken place, 
such as the country of Mali setting up guards to protect archaeological sites in such areas as Jene Geno. But from what I understand, the looting and the art theft continues. And I think you should all be aware of this tragic loss of the history of mankind. Thank you for joining us during Black History Month on our journey to the National Museum of African Art. Remember, this is just a small portion of the museum and we will have much more to show in the future.